So I have the privilege of introducing our speaker for this March Grand Rounds. I'm very excited to have Dr. Ni Cheng Liang with us. She is a, a mother and a wife, a cancer survivor, a mindfulness teacher, teacher of MBSR, and director of pulmonary integrative medicine at Coastal Pulmonary Associates, affiliated with the Scripps Health Network in San Diego, California. So it's quite early in California this morning. Thank you for getting up uh, early to be with us. And I learned in listening to Dr. Liang's podcast that there's a piece of her background that's not included in her professional bio, but she's also an avid paddler, which for some of us here in land of many lakes will be of interest. And she paddles dragon and races dragon boats with a team of cancer survivors. Um, so I hope you don't mind me adding that in there. I found that super interesting, Dr. Liang, among your many other um, amazing skills and assets. So she is a leader on and international speaker on wellness, on mindfulness, anti-racism, integrative and pulmonary medicine. And she's taught courses, led retreats, and designed wellness curricula for a decade. She is a voluntary assistant professor of medicine at UCSD and volunteers there for their free clinic run by medical students. She's been recognized as a four-time San Diego top doctor, received the San Diego American Lung Association Lung Health Provider of the Year Award in 2019, and in 2021 was recognized by Mindful Magazine as one of the 10 powerful women of the mindfulness movement. Dr. Leon co-hosts the Mindful Healers podcast and founded the Mindful Healthcare Collective, providing free well-being sessions to reduce suffering amongst healthcare professionals. We're really quite excited to have you with us today and excited for all of you who've logged in to hear this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Leon, for, for joining us and helping us to learn more about what anti-racist medicine, mindfulness, and well-being looks and feels like. So with that, I will hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and for the invitation to be here with all of you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen at this time. And this topic is near and dear to my heart, in part because of the last three years of experience in experiencing racism for my family and also for myself. I think in the last three years being an immigrant family, we collectively have experienced more racism than we have collectively having ever been in the United States. So the last three years has really been a test and also part of why it has galvanized me to become a bit more outspoken about the need for anti-racism, especially within healthcare. So thank you so much for the invitation to speak with all of you today. And these are my disclosures. None will be pertinent for today's talk. So I'd like to open with a practice called the ICU practice. And this ICU practice is inspired by Professor Rhonda McGee's work in anti-racism and mindfulness. And I'm gonna actually stop sharing my slides and invite all of you to come off of masking the videos and seeing if we can get more people on video so that we can honor each other's presence. And I promise you can go back to turning off your video cameras, but for the purposes of this talk and how warm and welcoming Lisa had introduced, there may be some discomfort that arises and it's helpful to honor some time with each other so that we might acknowledge each other's presence. And so thank you so much for those of you who are able to come off of shielding the camera. And so the ICU practice is basically to take some time to notice and look at the human beings that are in the little rectangles. And perhaps you offer a smile to each person in this shared community here today. 
So going row by row or line by line, looking at everyone that's here today, acknowledging their own stories and their history and their ancestors' history of everything that they're bringing to this community today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for participating in that practice with me. And I will go back to the slides now. Okay, jumping right in, we're going to be defining racism and anti racism as it particularly relates to the practice of medicine and then learning about how racism and cultural appropriation might show up in how we heal as integrative providers. Then we're going to, most importantly, get some ideas on how to develop our own personalized strategies so that we might set the intention to become anti-racist integrative healers. And I wanted to set the stage with this powerful video by the Othering and Belonging Institute at University of California in Berkeley. Of all the forces shaping politics and power around the world, perhaps none are more important than our sense of who we are and who we are becoming. We are in a period of accelerated change in at least four areas, globalization, technology, the environment, and demographic change. We can only process so much change in a short period of time without experiencing anxiety, which is a normal biological reaction. But how we respond to this anxiety is social. Our response is greatly shaped by the stories presented by leadership and through culture. These stories speak to our deepest values and our core beliefs about who we are many of which operate at the subconscious level. We can respond to these changes either as a threat or as an opportunity. The first response is breaking. The second is bridging. Breaking can create a deep fear of other groups, making it easier to accept false stories of us versus them. Breaking perpetuates isolation, hardens racism, and builds oppressive systems are driving our politics and institutions toward anti-democratic and inhumane practices. The other response is bridging, which calls on us to imagine a larger and inclusive way. When we bridge, we see demographic change and our diverse identities as positive and enhancing who we are. Bridging calls on us to engage in healthy dialogue, requires us to listen deeply. Bridging does not mean abandoning your identity, Bridging means acknowledging our shared humanity, rejecting that there is a them, and moving toward a future where there is instead a new us. But when we bridge, we not only open up to others, we also open up to challenges within ourselves, where we can participate in creating a society built on belonging. So it's with that foundation of creating belonging and a larger us, a larger we, that I'm coming back to give you this talk. And so you might be starting off here, you might be starting off here or here, you might be on a bridge, you might have built a bridge, you might be a bridge, but I hope that all of us can be eventually along the same path that goes towards becoming anti-racist. Dr. Leong, we're not, I'm not seeing your slides right now. Oh, uh, okay. Let me see here. 
Thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go back one slide. And I think what I just said probably makes more sense. <laughs> Um, so I was just saying that you might be starting off on this road or this road, maybe being on this bridge, but all of us eventually, hopefully, aiming towards the same direction in becoming anti-racist healers. And like the video prompted, we can co-create a larger, broader container of inclusion and create spaciousness to include an expansive we an expansive us. And the following slides are a bit of a roadmap as to how to broach this presentation and how to broach anti-racism work in your own lives. Really, the foundational aspect of this work has to be held in awareness, or basically mindfulness, and also compassion, which are two wings of the same bird. So holding all of this work all of the work that you are already doing with mindfulness and compassion, not just for others, but also for yourself. I also invite you to cultivate a beginner's mind. Many of you have already participated in some anti-racism training or bias work, and I invite you to come to today's presentation as if anew not coming in with any preconceived notions or expectations or any shoulds about how you should be feeling, what you should be doing, what I should say, but really being open to the experience just as it is, as it unfolds. And that may create a sense of openness so that new possibilities, new growth, new learning, new ideas may arise more easily. And discomfort is normal for this type of work that is so deeply important for helping alleviate suffering. In fact, making any strides in diversity, equity, inclusion work really does hinge upon discomfort. And that normalizing this discomfort and any of the difficult emotions that might arise like anger or sadness is part of the journey. When you expect that in some instances, or you aren't necessarily surprised when it arises, and then it can help you avoid shutting down and disengaging from the learning and growth process. Knowing that difficulty is a starting point and it's a necessary starting point for all of this. And so staying open to difficult emotions and discomfort being curious with yourself, naming what it is that you're feeling, and then also asking yourself why. Why is this particular emotion arising? And if you happen to identify as from being from a marginalized group, especially if you're the only person from that marginalized group in a community and organization, making sure that you treat yourself with self-compassion so that you aren't given the expectation, usually upon representing the entire diaspora of that culture or that ethnicity, that you bring yourself to the table and you are more than worthy and more than enough, just as you are. And then also, there is no deadline in any of this anti-racism work to get it or to process all of this. This is a lifelong work that I hope that we will be engaging in together. So there's no one way to process difficult emotions. Some options are mindfulness. You can look inward and name your thoughts, feelings, body sensations. You might share with a trusted colleague or friend, a therapist perhaps. And then as you're ready to engage in different resources, there's a myriad of different resources out there. Uh, and then the one thing I will ask of you for this talk and also 
beyond in your own anti-racism journey is to slow down with trying to fix or finding a solution right away or making a difficult emotion go away. Remembering that anti-racism work and diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work hinges on discomfort. So sitting a bit longer with your what you're feeling and why you're feeling with it. All of us as healers are so conditioned to wanting to alleviate suffering, sometimes as quickly as possible. But in this work, it's actually more helpful to lean into and be with the discomfort a while longer. And then also for those who have been impacted by racism or bias, it is so important to touch in with yourself on examining how much bandwidth you have to confront, to engage in this work. Sometimes the most self-compassionate action is to disengage or pause before responding. And I'm gonna bring up the circles of safety because this can act as a compass of sorts in this work. So touching in with where you're at, if I say something or I show something that triggers you into a zone of overwhelm when your sympathetic nervous system is very activated, that is not gonna be conducive to learning or growth. And that is your body's way of telling you to come back into your zone of safety. And so you can use some of the recommendations that Lisa so eloquently guided us this morning, noticing the support of the ground beneath your feet, paying attention to your breath, basically noticing your present moment experience is one easy way to come back into your zone of safety. I hope to at least somewhat keep you in a zone of challenge for this talk. Uh, the zone of challenge is where a lot of growth and learning can then occur. And then again, atop a foundation of compassion for all of this, recognizing that we are experts at compassion for others and humanity is much less kind to ourselves. But recognizing that we all aspire to alleviate suffering and that same kindness and that same action oriented mindset can be turned upon ourselves. So jumping in the title of today's talk was inspired by Ibram X Kendi's book, how to be an anti-racist. And so racism uh, really is stemming from racist ideas and racist ideas basically is any idea that suggests a racial group is in any way superior or inferior to another racial group. Whereas a anti-racist idea helps to promote racial equity and that there is inherently nothing right or wrong about any particular group of people. Therefore, racism becomes a collection of those racist ideas and policies that promotes racial inequity and then anti-racism conversely are a collection of anti-racist policies that help to bring about racial equity. And then in order for all of us to be anti-racist, we actually have to set the intention and hold ourselves accountable for action. We have to actually, what he says in his book, require a radical reorientation of consciousness because society, especially Western society, is so steeped in systemic oppression and structural racism. And that is not more apparent than within the social determinants of health being education access, healthcare quality, access to safe neighborhoods and environments, social and community supports, and financial stability. As a frontline pulmonologist taking care of COVID patients for the last three years, this COVID pandemic has been a glaring example of health disparities. We would get multiple emails in the week and each email would have a table of the different hospital systems that would show the number of inpatient admissions for COVID. So San Diego is pretty big. And as we go south in the areas highlighted in red, 
there are many more people who identify as Black Indigenous people of color as we head towards the Mexican border. And so you can see here that there were many more COVID-19 admissions compared to North County, San Diego, that is not as diverse. And the CDC data most recently showed that American Indians, Black or African Americans or Latinx peoples were more likely to have COVID, be hospitalized, or were more likely to die from COVID compared to white counterparts. And then disparities in integrative therapies are also rather apparent. In the National Health Interview Survey, this study looked at the usage of different integrative modalities like yoga, meditation, and chiropractic care. And you can see in the gray and the green bars that represent non-Hispanic, Black, and Hispanics, there was overall less usage of these integrative modalities compared to white counterparts. And so going into what drives a lot of these disparities, and that's basically structural racism. Structural racism is therefore drived, driven by implicit biases. And lots of the American history from slavery to Jim Crow laws to anti-immigration policies and history have led to practices which have driven inequitable outcomes and racial disparities that have steeped so deeply into the way people treat each other. Different association stereotypes and assumptions about other groups of people that further lead to more history and policies and practices. And so we need to disrupt that narrative. But I want to share a little bit about medicine and racism within medicine, because unfortunately, there's a lot of structural racism that is still in medicine to this day. In this New England Journal of Medicine paper, it was looking at medical school curricula. And when I was in medical school, I was taught to identify a patient in the history of present illness with a race identifier. But now looking back more than 20 years later, recognizing that race is actually a social and power construct, that we are more than 99% genetically identical, then race actually becomes not an accurate portrayal of differences in biology. But what's happened because of the reductionistic views on classifying people into black and white categories, this then prompted different racial and ethnic differences to be associated with different disease burdens. And there hasn't been a contextualization with regards to how the social determinants of health have played into the resulting health disparities. So then races have become associated with different diseases and that the guideline care that has come out of this type of reductionistic view on classifying people reflects upon the association between disease and particular race categories. <clears throat> so there has been a shift in acknowledgement that there's been more race-based medicine that's been practiced and we have to make a conscious choice to shift to race conscious medicine. What happened with race-based medicine was the clinical research studies linking different results and outcomes with race, and then racial groups became associated with different diseases that led to the healthcare bias and the stereotyping that further drove racial and health inequities. What we can do now in the 21st century in this somewhat post-COVID pandemic era is race conscious medicine. And that's recognizing at the forefront that race is a power and social construct 
And we have to look back at how structural racism has influenced the way that medical research has been published and also taught within medical education so that we can then develop actual adequate supports to overcome those structural barriers to health so that we can start moving the needle on these health disparities. And I can't go into a talk with integrative healers without talking about cultural appropriation. And so I'm going to shift a little bit here and talk a little bit about that inclusive of colonization. So cultural appropriation is basically when you don't acknowledge or when you inappropriately adopt the customs, practices, or ideas of one people or a society, particularly by members of another and typically more dominant people or society. And then colonization is the action of the appropriation um, of that knowledge, of that wisdom, a place or a domain for one's own use. And some of the examples of cultural appropriation within integrative medicine include yoga that I'll go a little bit more into, as well as mindfulness meditation. Uh, a lot of mindfulness, when it's taught in a more reductionistic way, drops a lot of the underpinnings of the Buddhist origins, and also the compassion becomes somewhat separate from mindfulness teaching when in actuality, when it was once taught, compassion and mindfulness were very much interlinked and much more taught at the same time rather than splitting them up. And then sweat lodges, there were people that died in sweat lodges that were led by people who were not appropriately trained, sadly. So ultimately, if we're using an integrative modality that is not of US or Europe, European origin, there's a risk of cultural appropriation and also imposing a colonizing lens upon that particular practice. And I wanted to share this particular quote because I think it captures the impact of colonization on integrative modalities. So through colonization, racial minorities wellness practices became commercialized and appropriated, which then contributed to the actual dilution of its meaning and the ostracization of people who actually practice it. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit more about the cultural appropriation of yoga in the United States. So there has been definitely an exploitation of holistic practices from ancient and sacred origins for financial gain, unfortunately, in the United States. So there's been a lot of disregard for the roots in the assimilation into Western culture. And then there's been this decontextualizing, this cherry picking of some of the practices like yoga being reduced to just the asanas or the poses, whereas the yoga tradition is much more than just poses. So it's getting taken out of the original context from which that entire community helped develop it from. Goodbye. And so how can we make a change? How can we reorient in a way that is healing? So we can set the intention to decolonize and looking inwards at ourselves and how we can do better and be better is just one tip of the iceberg. So we can seek intentionally to unlearn misinformation and prejudices, and we can relearn the context and the truth from the original roots of these non-Western practices. And that in and of itself is so integral for the health of those that we seek to heal and also the community at large. And so Leah Penniman is an African-American herbalist who was featured in a Healthline article highlighting alternative medicine. And she recommends three C's to avoid appropriation. And so those three C's include consent. So getting consent from that indigenous person or craftsperson to even be sharing aspects of their knowledge, to give them credit and also to com compensate them rightfully, either 
in monetary or non-monetary ways for what has been shared. And we also know that there are significant barriers to the underserved with regards to accessing integrative modalities. And it's summarized by the four A's. So there's a lack of awareness, a lack of availability, the lack of accessibility, and the lack of affordability for many integrative modalities. Drs. Chow and Adler wrote a powerful paper that I have cited here that I recommend all of you take a look at. But we, as a group of integrative healers, can overcome a somewhat elitism that has developed in integrative medicine and also even the insularity of academic medicine to develop healing practices in a community that's much more pluralistic and inclusive, that we can use integrative medicine and it has to be used in a way so that we can help foster health justice. <clears throat> and we have an organization within the integrative medicine sphere that does just that. And it's I am for us or integrative medicine for the underserved. I really enjoyed the last year's conferences on this and they take this work as part of their mission statement that they recognize the importance of equity and wellness and prevention and patient empowerment and self care as being a important component of access of healthcare for all recognizing that the underserved need different and unique resources in order for them to access these integrative healing modalities and that we can collaborate and share outcomes and processes so that it may inspire us to continue with this wholehearted work that keeps us engaged and hopefully not burnt out. And so in summarizing this health justice work and how integrative medicine can be part of this health justice work, we can leverage integrative medicine to advance health equity and we can promote a culture that upholds inclusion and diversity, equity, and inclusion. The origins of many of our modalities are diverse in nature. And we can also address what we're coming to this community with, our own beliefs, our own behaviors that have in the past perpetuated ongoing bias and discrimination, because we are all guilty of it at some point in time holding that with compassion and mindful awareness. And so solutions on how to do this. So we can expand and co-create a larger we, a broader us, a spaciousness that goes beyond racial and language barriers. So we can encompass the understandings of the diverse healthcare practices and the origins from which those diverse healthcare practices came from. And then understanding the different models of disease with the different terminologies that our patients and other healthcare practitioners use. So I wanted to share some aspects of these articles taken from the psychology literature in recommending a higher patient-centered communication style where we understand and seek to become aware of our patients' individual social contexts, that we take some time to understand what their values are and what their own models of health, well-being, and disease are. We can seek to become more culturally competent, and the terminology now is much more towards cultural humility as opposed to cultural competence, but we know that Engaging in that particular type of education can help with improving patient experience and satisfaction, as well as adherence to different healthcare plans. And I put an asterisk by outcomes because the outcomes literature has been somewhat less clear. 
And I think that part of it is because the definition of cultural competence is not agreed upon and also the measures for assessing competence has not been laid out very clearly. So there is a need for much more research with regards to outcomes. But I think we can all agree that cultural competence in this anti-racism work is a step towards health equity. So similar to meeting ourselves where we're at in our anti-racism journey, I invite you to meet your patients where they're at and bring about a culturally adaptive lens in being more flexible as you're delivering your healing modalities, adjusting to your patient's needs beyond that of an ethnically associated language, but providing communication with them in a way that they are able to understand. Recognizing that there's a diverse presence of beliefs and different models of illness and health that our patients hold. Also encompassing and being curious about their own cultural and religious or spiritual practices. And then when it's helpful to do so, of course, including the input of caregivers and family members. And so in bringing back that New England Journal of Medicine paper, recommendations and solutions were suggested, inclusive of referencing patients where needed from their country of origin as opposed to a particular race categorization. And then also being conscious about contextualizing if they do have a certain disease, how the social determinants of health have played a role in the development of that disease. And then ultimately keeping our research bodies, institutions, healthcare systems accountable for further best practices development that doesn't hinge so much on race-based medicine. And so from an individual level, we can use mindfulness as a foundation for meeting ourselves where we're at and for noticing anything that comes along in this important journey. For those of you who are not from a marginalized group, please be an ally and I will tell you a little bit more about helpful allyship. And then also to engage in mindful communication, especially from patients who are marginalized. And so mindful communication is much more about listening. It's about providing a safe space for your patient to share their story and for you to ask questions, but the questions seek out clarity. And mindful communication is a place where you don't talk about yourself, where you don't ask questions that judge or that give advice or that criticize. And you can also get curious about what your own implicit biases are. So Harvard has an implicit bias test bank where you can access and it's free. And then you can also practice color insight, which is a mindful anti-racism practice that has been coined by Professor Rhonda McGee. So in terms of allyship, empathize with the struggle of marginalized communities and we need help with having a platform from which to amplify voices and so taking some of your own privilege and sharing that with those from marginalized communities can be very helpful and as i talk to you about this work and as you witness and see racism in action, it's uncomfortable for everyone. But realizing that if you're not from a marginalized community, yes, there's discomfort there, but to try to decenter yourselves from that particular discomfort and make yourself aware of the discomfort and the pain and the trauma that has been and is being inflicted by those from marginalized communities 
And then understanding that your education and your anti racism journey is really up to you. You can certainly hold healthcare systems accountable in some respects, but ultimately your anti racism education lies upon you. I highly recommend this TED talk by Luvi Ajayi Jones who gave a TED talk on getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I wanted to share some powerful quotes. So people and systems actually count on silence to keep us exactly where we are. And speaking truth to power should not be sacrificial. I invite all of you to be dominoes. And that only entails being exactly who we are not just when it's difficult, but especially when it's difficult. And we have to seek true inclusion and belonging, not just representation from diverse community. We can truly include by cultivating a culture of candor. And that culture of candor allows for people who are from marginalized communities to show up exactly as they are without having to censor any aspect of their identities for assimilation, where we can speak up, where we can challenge, where we can have diverging opinions and feel safe to share that with transparency and empathy. So in terms of belonging, it's the spirit of being seen, heard, and appreciated in your full humanity. It is a basic human type of respect. And it includes this right to co-create the entity, the organization that we're joining and to make demands upon society to be better and to do better. And ultimately it helps free people from hierarchy dominance. And mindfulness provides a foundation, a starting point for all of this work. Mindfulness has been shown in medical literature to reduce implicit bias. It disrupts racism. It helps to cultivate empathy. It has a capacity to make us better healers, and of course it promotes pro-social behavior. And there are different ways to be skillful in confronting racism. Of course, checking in with your circles of safety, checking in with your own well-being bandwidth as to whether or not you can take on this confrontation. You can basically start off with just sheer curiosity. When you hear a statement or when you witness something, asking more about that. You can also share your own perspectives. You can speak your truth. You can also agree to disagree. And also at the core of this is self-compassion. So you can simply be intentional about putting a pin in it where you can give yourself some time and space to help process and then also firm set boundaries is one powerful way also to confront racism. So in terms of a bit more about the color insight practice from Professor Rhonda McGee, I also highly recommend this book if you're interested in the intersection between mindfulness and anti-racism work, the inner work of racial justice, healing ourselves and transferring, transforming our communities through mindfulness. So we can ground towards how racism has shown up in our own lives and seek to understand how racism has operated in others' lives. And then most importantly, it's the capacity to be with and to listen to others' lived experiences, to others' truths. And then we can all commit to act in favor of liberation. And so I'm gonna invite you to participate in uh, mindful anti-racism practice. And as always, mindfulness practices are always invitations. So if you don't feel like participating, that's totally okay. But for those of you who would like to join me, I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes or lower your gaze in front of you. Noticing the support that is ever present beneath your feet or beneath your body as you're sitting. And then bringing to your mind's eye a potentially mild or moderately uncomfortable 
situation where you either experienced or witnessed racism? Checking in with your body sensations, noticing what's arising for you as I'm asking you to do this. Noticing any emotions that might be arising. And then asking yourself this question, how have the ways in which marginalized groups and how they've been perceived influenced your own thoughts about yourself? How have the ways in which marginalized groups and their perceptions influenced your own thoughts about yourself? And perhaps there's some thoughts about labels that have been used or different locations in your life. that have been particularly associated with marginalized communities? And what does that reveal about you? And noticing any discomfort that arises, checking again with body sensations and emotions, recognizing that Discomfort is an opportunity for curiosity. Getting curious about what it is that you're feeling and why. And then giving yourself some self-compassion. So inviting you to place both hands atop your heart and pushing in a little bit there. We know that that reduces cortisol levels. And perhaps in this anti-racism work, you change the hand that's closest to your heart into a fist, into a fist that's cradled by your other hand of support, of backing. That this hand that's turned into a fist is a commitment towards doing this hard work, towards engaging in this hard work allowing and accepting yourself exactly where you are in this journey. Reminding you that there's a shared common humanity in the dis discomfort of this work. And then as you're ready, releasing your hands, noticing what's here for you now after that brief mindful anti-racism practice. And taking some time to maybe jot down some reflection. And if you feel so compelled to feel free to share in the chat what came up for you. And as you're ready, rejoining the larger group, thank you so much for practicing with me. So hopefully I have shed some light on the reality of anti-racism as well as cultural appropriation and how it shows up in medicine and integrative medicine and that we together can strive more towards not just equality, but equity in which we can seek to provide resources for especially those that we seek to heal so that they might have the same opportunities and so that we can act in favor of liberation for all of humanity. We know that anti-racism work helps to reduce barriers to employment, it increases education access, it helps to reduce racism within the criminal justice system. It helps the 
future of youth, especially those who are at risk. It helps with increasing resources to the community and also engages others in social and political participation and action. So I invite you to co-create a culture of health with me that is inclusive, that is consistent of a wide variety of diversity from beliefs, customs, and values and beyond. Because ultimately, in order to create a culture of health, it has to be as diverse and as multifaceted as the population that we seek to serve. And we can do this by agreeing to make health a shared value by fostering cross-sector collaboration to improve well-being by creating healthier and more equitable communities so that we can strengthen and integrate health services and systems to make them more accessible for all. And this is the 10,000 foot view of what that might look like. So health equity through transformed systems for health recognizing in the background our social, political, racial, economic, historical, and environmental contexts, and that through community engagement at the core, we can have strengthened partnerships and alliances, we can expand our knowledge, we can improve health and healthcare programs and policies so that we might have thriving communities. And so in summary, for all of you, how can you become an anti-racist integrative healer so you can practice mindfulness with self-compassion recognizing wherever you're at on this journey learn more about what your own implicit biases are and also learn more about the cultural and historic roots of the modalities that you offer and also of the modalities that you are referring your patients to and then noticing with curiosity and also compassion where your biases do show up, where cultural appropriation and colonization shows up in how you heal others. And then setting the intention and asking yourself these questions, how are you going to be a bridge or build bridges? And how can we practice inclusion and belonging to expand to co-create a larger we as part of this culture of health? And so I'm gonna ask for you to commit today and my dear friend and physician executive coach, Dr. Ivana Tor, recommends asking, what's your tika? And your tika is, what's your tiny, imperfect, consistent action? We know that that consistent action and the acceptance of imperfection is helpful towards habit change and then leading towards culture change. So what's one tiny, imperfect, consistent action that you can commit towards being an anti-racist integrative healer? And there are some resources for you that I will leave with you, um, as well as not forgetting your own departments, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, division. And then please join Integrative Medicine for the underserved, or at least check out their website. And so thank you so much for your attention, recognizing that my humanity is bound up in yours and that we can only be human together. I look forward to creating bridges and being bridges with you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your attention.